and pour a new bench in there and get that all cleared up. So this takes care of that. We actually save money by doing this than what the contract was for removing the old manhole and the extra uh, pipe that we needed. So that was a good deal. Uh, change order number four is for additional asphalt work. Uh, there was some, quite a bit of pavement that was damaged. Uh, the, the contract itself had a, just the trench width. Um, we came to an agreement with the contractor on kind of splitting the difference on the, the charges for the additional asphalt patch for what was damaged out there. And you know, part of it too is just the road falling apart out there. So uh, that one was $7,200. So those are the, the three change orders. And like I said, this will wrap up the project. Uh, another little tidbit about this. Uh, we'll see it in the progress payment, but the project is 9% over budget uh, with these change orders. Of that 9%, 42% of that is from the, the design changes we had with the changes with Stramowski before the project even started. And that was uh, change order one, that was the $53,000. Uh, that we changed in the plans before we started to reline the uh, sanitary sewer north-south across the Stromowski property. So, uh, I think the project went very well and, and only had a couple little hiccups along the way, but nothing that uh, big surprise or big shocks there. So Thomasini did a really good job for us and I think the project is a, a bonus for the city. So after this one, how many have we got left? Two? Two. Fantastic. Any concerns, gentlemen? Oh, I think it's great. We're getting it finished and cleaned up and we're getting rid of that lift station. Get a motion. Deepert moves to approve the uh, change orders two, three, and four for Jewel Street yeah. Sanitary Sewer. Gail a second. Roll call. Seaford, aye. Gail, aye. Zagali, aye. Richards, aye. Weatherly Drive? Weatherly Drive. This is uh, connecting up two dead ends, a water main along Weatherly. So when we redid uh, the road, on Weatherly that was two cul-de-sacs. They put the road through and installed the new bridge. Uh, this project will connect the water main on the ends of Waring and Wilding on the north side of Weatherly. Uh, this will be another deep directional bore project. Uh, it's roughly 933 feet of an eight inch main, but we're going underneath the creek and we're going underneath the, the cross culverts that were installed with the road. So another 20 foot deep water main and another creek crossing for us. But it will uh, improve the water quality, improve the fire flow for that area and get rid of two dead ends for us. So we had uh, eight bidders on this project. Uh, Five Star Energy Services was a low bidder at 149, 411. Now the engineer's estimate on this was 171. So we're doing good on our, uh, our estimate. Well, Five Star Energies, you guys might not have heard of them before. They are a new company, um, new to the area this year. They are uh, an old reach of KS, which did a lot of work with uh, We Energies uh, doing gas and electric installs. Uh, they sold that company, they started this new company. So they have the capability to do their own directional drilling. So they're not subbing that work out. Uh, they've done some work in Milwaukee this year. Milwaukee's been happy with them. So we'll give them a try and I think we got a good, good price here. So we'll see what they can do. Looks good. Get a motion. Sagali moves to approve contract for Five Star Energy for Weatherly Drive. Gail, second. Okay, Gail, roll call. 
Deep or die? Yellow. It's the yellow eye. Richard's eye. Amendment three. Uh, this is uh, with uh, CH2M Hill, which is now uh, Jacobs. This is our general services contract. Uh, we've had this in place since 2012. This is the third amendment to it. Uh, this amendment is for uh, $100,000. Uh, this is for various projects that we have with uh, Jacobs uh, that do a lot of work down at the treatment plant. Uh, in particular, one of the things they're working on is the PLC replacement down there, um, working with the, the SCADA equipment and the PLC. So that's uh, something we're looking to have done next year. And we'd like to get these guys going on this project. Yeah, when I turned around and I read some of the other further detail on the PLCs, and I think we had five of them or something that was over 20 years old, it's, I start getting scared. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, any concerns about this, guys? How long is this contract going? Are we extending this? Is this a one year, two years for the $100,000? No, the general services contract is just this, this open contract that we have with Jacobs on it kind of a on-call as needed basis with okay. work at the treatment plant, particularly. And I think it's not like they're utilized a lot, but it's you know, like the last sentence you have on your report there, Brian, on average, we have spent $28,000 a year over the past seven years with these guys. So it's, it's not something that's, uh, you know, intense at all. So this is just kind of a fail safe. They're okay. just doing design and consulting for us. Correct. Um, they will do the design for the PLC replacement. Uh, they have written all the code and everything for all the SCADA software and everything at the plant. So that, that's why it's kind of particular for them. Of that design, uh, that estimate was $97,000 for the, the PLC replacement design which is why we're asking for the, the 100,000. And that'll be a big contract when that goes out for bid. Yes, sir, it will. All right, any other concerns on this one? Get a motion. Okay, I'll move to approve amendment number three to the professional services agreement with CH2M Hill Engineers, Inc. Valley seconds. Roll call. Deeper die. Yellow eye. Valley eye. Richards eye. Uh, Mike, chemical costs. Uh, yes, this is uh, for information for everyone. Uh, just an idea of any increases or decreases, uh, and kind of just a an idea how much uh, the chemicals. <clears throat> excuse me, costs down here at the water treatment plant. Uh, some of them stayed the same, as you can see, there was uh, some decrease and one increase. Uh, was able to lock in a two-year price with the Coagulin H1050A, which saved us uh, a good amount of money. It probably won't look so good next year when we have to go back up to the new price, but for now we saved um, almost $5,000 by having that agreement. And Mike, right on that one on the coagulant. So the 2021 cost is really 26 cents a pound, right? Not 27 and a half as it's showing there. Well, for everyone else, it's 27 and a half. Since I locked in for two years last year with these guys, we're still getting it at 26 cents for this year. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, just as a reminder, North Shore Water Utility puts this together for us. They get bids from all these chemical companies for all of the, uh, I shouldn't say all, but generally all of the uh, shore, the, the surface water utilities in the area. And we've been uh, combined with them, working, collaborating with them for a, quite a long time. And it's really yielded good, good chemical pricing for all the utilities. Yeah, these prices look pretty consistent. So that's a good deal. 
Any other concerns? Get a motion on chemicals. Deeper moves to approve the chemical costs for this coming year. Sigali second. Sigali seconds. Roll call. Deeper aye. Gilly aye. Gilly aye. Richards aye. Vouchers. I think the only one that I noticed that I was curious about was uh, on the first page was the utility trailer for 4,300 bucks. Yeah, what we did on that one is the challenge we've been running into is moving our lift to the treatment plant uh, when they need it. We've been borrowing a trailer from the highway department and a lot of times it's either not available, they don't want it out in the snow when we need it, uh, things like that. So we did some shopping around and we purchased a, it's a full tilt trailer. And with this full tilt trailer, we'll be able to haul the lift. We can put our skid loader on it. We can put our easement machine on it, um, which we'll be putting the easement machine trailer up for auction because that one, we had a lot of problems hooking it up to trucks and things like that. And Going forward, we are going to probably be looking at possibly utilizing a um, renting a asphalt machine or not an asphalt machine, a roller highway department one. I think the numerous times we used it this year, half the time it was out of service. That's becoming a lot more difficult for them to get parts for. So we may look at renting a uh, asphalt roller may look at cost efficiency. We may rent it for a week or a month at a time and nail out all of our asphalt paving projects throughout there. So just kind of an all around um, general trailer that'll suit our needs a little bit better than what we had in the fleet. Okay. Any other concerns guys on the vouchers? No, it looks pretty good. Get a motion. Seifert moves to approve the uh, vouchers or payment. Give us a second. Roll call. Seifert aye. Gill is aye. Gully aye. Richards aye. Investments. Uh, yeah, well. It looks like we have a uh, go through the deposits or the customer payments we received. The withdrawals were pretty close to October's voucher report. Two payrolls during November and a couple of debt payments. And we had a pretty low interest rate for our LGIP. And then also a little better for the BMO investments. I don't know what is there anything else we normally go through with this? I got the the, the upcoming capital projects as part of the reserve fund. No, Derek, this that, that's pretty much it. We just kind of go over some of the and anything that looks out of the norm. And you know, clearly the interest rates have always been an issue at times, but there's there's nothing unless there's something special about you know, jumping uh, uh, from one area to another, you know, like pulling some money out of uh, the bonds into the checking account or into the local government investment pool. So no, I don't think so. There was just one, one, one part of BMO, one investment matured and got put into checking, but that was about it. Yeah. Any concerns there, gentlemen? No, it looks good. None for me, Dale. Okay. Uh, 
Do we need an approval on that summary? No, sir, for, for information only. Okay, how about the, the uh, CIP? Okay, uh, so the capital budget uh, this time, we've got a number of sheets. There's, uh, I believe in your packets, probably the cash flow sheet is first. You can put that behind the packet. We'll get to that at the end. Uh, so with the packet for the capital, I'll go through a couple of items and then I'll turn it over to the individual departments for them to talk about their requests as well. Uh, you can see on the first sheet, general summary shows the individual departments and then the capital project as a whole and what the total of those projects are. The second sheet breaks down within the department specifically what uh, each item is for and then the packet will go in more detail on those particular items. Uh, so I'll kind of gloss through that on the very bottom of that second sheet. It does show you the five-year history of capital investment. Um, it's not as great a tool as it, as it might seem as there's, there's been some uniqueness uh, over the last several years, but it still is, it does show historically what we, what we have done. So with that, I'll start going into the individual items. Uh, I'll take the administrative in general this time. This is something I had worked on uh, before Derek was here, but we've been talking about this for a while. The title is actually, it should be phone system, uh, not utility billing software, so that we can correct that right off. The phone system here in the office is over 18 years old, it, which is just kind of amazing by itself. It's given us really pretty flawless service, uh, but you're not going to be able to get parts for it. We actually priced up some stuff on eBay in case we needed to do an emergency repair. Uh, the city, when they transferred over to the new building, we had an opportunity of, of going onto their network as well but it was uh, an expensive proposition and our phone system was working fine. So it didn't seem like there was a lot of extra value there. Now, uh, here we are several years later and our phone system is just getting older and older. And uh, it needs to be updated. Uh, you, I don't, you can't get a phone system for an office like this for $10,000. And, and this price is working through the city system. So it's a cost of the equipment that would be needed. Uh, in order to put together this system. I'm sure there'll be a few little miscellaneous things. I think the actual equipment is about $8,000 for the phones and uh, the switches that are needed, that sort of thing. It added quite a bit of functionality that we don't have now, although my phone hardly ever rings compared to where it used to ring, you know, five years ago and 10 years ago for sure. Uh, but there's a lot of functionality where you can transfer or automatically transfer voicemail to text and send that to your cell phone so you can be in better communication. Uh, modernizing, right? I mean, this phone system has been here for 20 years, so we don't have a lot of those great features. Uh, we actually found, we, we had a, a few of us had a small notification from the system that we had a voicemail in the office. It would simply send you that note, it would call you, it wouldn't text you. We found out that's a vulnerability and people can hack into that and start using our phone system for calling who knows where. So yeah, that's not really a good thing either. So transferring over makes an awful lot of sense. Uh, that cost us $10,000. And We'll go through and explain everything. I, I, well, I'll do it and I'll encourage you, the other department heads to uh, pause. If you guys have any questions, just jump in and ask them. We'll look at uh, a motion on the whole capital budget when we're, when we're at the end. So with that, I'll turn it over to Darren. But Darren's muted. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it worked out a lot better. That was part of my plan. So, um, so the first one on there is a construction coordinator vehicle replacement. So right now, Seth's truck is the only compact truck in the fleet. Um, it's almost 10 years old. I will note on there that this is not the oldest vehicle in the fleet, but with the compact size, it's just proven to be very difficult, um, especially with the amount of time Seth's have, Seth has spent in it. Um, due to COVID being out of the office, um, hauling around a lot of the equipment that was, it just proved to be too small of a truck. So um, just looking for a, a half ton four wheel drive extended cab truck, just make the um, room for hauling equipment and tools a little bit easier on this one. Uh, meter exchange, looking to replenish the 225 roughly meters that went out this year to keep our stock in there um, of the roughly 450 that we like to replace. So a little bit less of a meter expense purchase this year, just due to the less houses that we were in um, 
for 2020. So that price is good, um, as you can see on there, through June. And we look to purchase them before them to get locked in at that lower price. Hey, Darren, just to jump in quick on the yes. previous item, you, you intend to keep or trade the uh, prior vehicle? We look at trading that one in. Um, a lot of times they can use it as a bargaining tool to get a better price on the vehicle. If it's something where we're looking at the auction site, we feel like we could get more money on the auction site, we would um, look at that route just to get the, the most out of that truck that we could get. Any feel, did you have, have it appraised what, what it's worth? Or? We have not yet. Uh, we can uh, pretty readily readily available go look at the wisconsin surplus site find comparable vehicles and find out what they're going for but a lot of times you'll get one um estimate or <clears throat> excuse me quote from a dealership where they offer you crazy money for this truck just to try to secure the sale and it's worked out pretty good for us in the past okay. um the darren, other vehicle darren on the on the uh, orion heads mm -hmm. how does it compare to last year is that about the same yeah it went up just a little bit um so just the the cost of it didn't change much i think basically their their inflation rates on there um i can get that number for you but it is a very a very good number and they locked it in for us is that badger meter yes it would still be badger meter yeah Okay. Um, the other vehicle is the meter reading vehicle. So this is a 2012, um, it's a Ram cargo van right now. This one by far, it has well surpassed the 85,000 miles on it. Uh, this one, we put the most miles on it a year. The um, cost of maintenance on this one is increasing. A comparable vehicle, um, you know, would be right around the 30,000 range. It would be the same thing where we'd look at trading this one in. Um, the body's starting to show a little bit of rust coming through, maintenance coming through. So we would look at something similar, uh, another cargo van. They got those little Ford connects running around now, just trying to find something. Um, the problem we have with the smaller ones now is blind spots, a lot of not, not a lot of windows in those utility ones like that, but need something that big so we can haul his um, service keys around and um, something you can get the meters in the back of there and so looking at replacing that one, like I said, once again, it's not the oldest one in the fleet, but by far the most used and the one that gets the, the most miles on it throughout the, the course of it. Uh, tandem dump truck, that one, we've been putting money in the reserve for the past couple of years and looking to add another 70,000 for that one. This one, this is the one that we use to pull the excavator around Back when we bought the truck, uh, the excavator, I don't even think was a question. Now that we have it, it has shown some damage on the frame rails from us adding the additional stress of the excavator to it. Um, still don't regret buying the excavator because that thing has saved us and improved its point, but the truck is underpowered. It is a, um, it has a clutch type automatic system in it. We'd be looking at a fully automatic one so um, estimate the repair cost right or the replacement cost right around 150,000 for a new one. We were um, we called up the highway department to ask how they like their tandem axles. They found out we were getting rid of it, and they showed serious interest in wanting to get this vehicle from us. So um, in talking with the highway department, they will be taking this vehicle from us, which would work out well for us because it would give us a backup truck if something were needed that could pull our excavator in an emergency. Um, a lot of their vehicles have, don't have the proper equipment to pull a trailer and they'd be looking at having something there to not put a plow on readily available and not have to worry about taking plows and salters and spreaders off in the winter if need be. Um, and, you know, they, it would be a win-win a for them. They have, offered to kind of replenish us with one of their trucks that was going to go on the auction site to kind of buy it from us. And just seems like a win-win for both departments as far as that would go. Great. Super. Yeah. Um, fire hydrant yeah. refinish. Oh, did you have anything, Dale? 
I was going to say that uh, I like the idea of getting a bigger dump truck to be hauling that that unit around. Yes, yeah, I do agree. The the newer ones are more powerful. They have the hitch, you know, integrated where it'll just be more fitting for what we're doing. Well, not only that, but you're going to have a better braking capacity to turn around and control that unit because you get a lot of weight going around. Yes, we do. Yeah, yeah, we sure do. <laughs> um, fire hydrant refinishing, we've done something similar to this in the past. Um, what we, we tried using our sandblaster system, it's not cut out for what we do. What we're trying to do, it was clumping the sand real well um, and it just wasn't working. So what we're trying to do is have a company come in, sandblast these things down to bare metal and then we would go out and refinish them because I feel like the refinishing that they did just didn't provide the results that I feel like we could do if we spent a little more time, whether they were doing it when it was still damp, weren't blowing the sand off good enough, things like that. So basically we're looking to have somebody come in, sandblast these things down to bare metal and have us continue on with refinishing these up to make them look good and, and withstand the, the weather and the beating that some of these are taking. Is that an epoxy paint that we put on there? We tried the epoxy paint. Um, that's what the past refinishers did. What we've been doing is buying the oil-based um, Rust-Oleum from Farm and Fleet, or I'm sorry, Menards. The, we were putting two coats on, and they have been holding up really well, surprisingly, for, for what the paint was, and i um, pretty happy with the end results we've been getting out of it. Okay. Um, and then the, the final thing was a reserve fund for the, uh, vac on. So that one's a 2014. So we'd be looking at right around the 10 year replacement model on that. So estimated being right around 400,000 replacements. So just starting to look at putting some money in a reserve fund. So when the time comes to replace that right around the 10, 11 year mark, we'll have something established. Sounds good. Any concerns on uh, Darren's toys? No, looks good. Okay, Brian. Get me unmuted here. Um, this is a satellite leak detection. Uh, if you remember last year, we put in uh, $15,000 into this budget. Uh, this is a uh, a satellite that goes around, takes a picture, they take it back, analyze it with some algorithm that they have, and they're able to determine water leaks in our system. They, they overlay our, our water main plans and are able to see if there's leaks somewhere in the system. Um, not sure how all that works, but they're able to determine that. Uh, Green Bay's used this for two years. They're really happy with this. Uh, program. Uh, it's cut costs for them and they're able to find a lot of leaks in their system relatively easily. Um, they're, since they're, it's narrowed down in their search, they don't have to try and search the whole system. They can go out and, and locate where these leaks are and take care of them. Uh, we were hoping to have adjoining communities kind of join in with us. Uh, the base is to have 500 miles of water main uh, we only have 200 miles, roughly, so we're hoping to have other communities join in with us. We haven't found anybody that wants to jump in on this, so we're looking to, to go ahead and proceed with this. Um, one other thing we're looking at is the possibility of raising this to 60, or excuse me, to $45,000. So we have a total of $60,000 in the budget so that we could do a two-year program. That'll save us over the two years, save us about 20 grand to go that route. And it'll give us the ability to go back and see how we're, we're doing in our system after the first year to go back and, and take a look at this again and see if the leaks are going away and, and how the program is actually working. Uh, that is what Green Bay did with their system and they were very happy with that as well, like I said. So uh, we'd look at changing this to $45,000 for the budget. Brian, is this a one-year contract for 25000 
Yes, it is. Thank you. I don't have any problem with that. I kind of like it from the preventative maintenance standpoint of being able to, you know, get a better view of where we're having issues. And you turn around and bring this to our attention. I don't know, was it about the same time last year and we, we talked about doing this? Yes, sir, we did. Um, this was at a couple of different uh, conferences that uh, we attended and in dealing with uh, Green Bay, um, you know, the, their familiarity with it and experience with it. And it seems like some really interesting technology. We know that we have links, leaks in our system. Uh, it's just a matter of being able to, to pinpoint them and find out where they're at. So this will assist in that and hopefully stop some of the lost water that we have. Brian, speaking of that, did Green Bay have any feel for what it saved them from unbuilt water? I don't know the, the percentage. I know that they definitely were, were satisfied with what they were seeing and how they were going about uh, locating those leaks. Uh, just the time effort that they were saving uh, to find those leaks. I still have mixed emotions about this. It is some voodoo that they do. But <laughs> I'm just worried about the workload. <laughs> now you got more re more leaks to repair it. Mm -hmm. Now we got more trucks to handle it. So <laughs> yeah, there we go. Try out the new dump truck right away. There we go, Brian. <laughs> All right. Do we have anybody got a concern about if we bump this up? No, I think two years makes sense, Deal. And, and we are still looking to have other communities join in with us. We're not throwing that out the window here. Um, if we can get somebody else on board, we'll definitely use them to, to help offset those costs. And we finally did get information from the, the satellite company to give us some prices to give the other communities. That was the biggest problem. And at one of the conferences, we talked to a number of utilities uh, in the area very interested in partnering on this. The issue has always been we couldn't get a price uh, for that price per mile uh, over the over the initial base. And so now we have that information and we can go in and solicit the other utilities too. Have we talked to Cudahy and South Milwaukee about this at all? Yeah, South Milwaukee at the time uh, didn't feel that they had the money to do it. Cudahy was very interested in it. Wauwatosa was very interested in it. Waukesha was very interested. Racine was interested in it. And this slide that they take, that they analyze, that minimum size slide is 1,200 square miles. So you can fit an awful lot of water main. I estimated about 5,000 miles of water main sits within that one slide. So uh, there certainly is opportunities here. Sounds good. And I'm not sure that once we do it and, you know, other people have got the opportunity to turn around and take a look and see what we're getting out of it, that they're not going to jump on the bandwagon. Brian, will we have a method, method of tracking the potential savings once we get this installed? We'll be able to track water loss and hopefully see a reduction in the water loss. Okay. Okay. I take it nobody's got a big big problem if we jack this up. Oh, what, 45,000? Is that right, Brian, 45? Yes. And then that would make it a two-year program. Okay. All right, treatment plan. All right, this is for replacing uh, and relining of our chlorine storage tanks. Uh, they are 10 years old currently, and it's recommended to replace them every 10 years. Uh, we have two large 5,600 gallon bulk tanks and two 564 gallon day tanks. Um, the cost for replacing them is listed below. There's a company out of Green Bay that can reline the larger tanks. 
uh, at a significant savings. I knew I'd get a call during this. <laughs> Uh, we'll just let that ring out. Sorry about that. Uh, so uh, the relining option saves us money now. The guy said that he has um, seen his six to 10 year lifetime on the relining. He's also seen it as much as 20 years. Uh, the good thing about this is that mm, that they can reline them again. Lord, sorry about this. <laughs> All right, you know I sat here for an hour and nothing, nothing <laughs> happened, right? <laughs> so the relining process can be redone again and again. I don't know if there's a number of times, but this would basically give us a new tank on the inside. We have seen some uh, deterioration indicators in our Y strainers. Uh, some of the uh, Fiberglass fibers, if you will, are we're catching them in our Y strainers, so they're coming from somewhere. I'm assuming the tanks. Uh, the smaller tanks are too small to get the relining equipment in, so those would have to be replaced. And we would also save the freight to the plant was for all four tanks. I'm assuming it might be a little less, and then we don't have to worry about any disposal costs. Uh, installing those larger tanks. Installing the larger tanks requires removing the roof panels, uh, the little uh, skylights, if you will, and craning them in. So it's quite a process. So we wouldn't have to deal with any of that. That's why the relining seems to be the best option in this case. And our previous tanks, bulk tanks, lasted 10 years. When we, we put them in in 99, when we did the expansion in uh, 2010, they were there were signs of failures of those tanks as well. So we knew not only the recommendation, but we knew from experience that they only last 10 years. That seems like a good plan there. And now our famous PLCs, <laughs> the ones that scared me. I thought I'd add a picture so everybody knows what they look like at least. Um, we went through this last year, we put some money in for our PLCs are long past their life expectancy. Uh, they're still supported as active mature, but more expensive to get the parts for them than buying new. Uh, this uh, amount added to the stuff set aside last year allows to complete the uh, replacement of all PLCs at the treatment plant. Uh, so it'd be one project instead of doing some one year and some the next year, which would probably cause some communication issues between the older and newer equipment. Uh, it would be nice to have them all done at one time. And there's not a lot of PLC companies out there. I mean, the big one in Wisconsin is clearly the Allen Bradley product and Holt Electric is the only supplier of that in the state, if I'm not mistaken. So we'll see what, uh, you know, our engineering friends are going to come up with as far as, uh, you know, a package and then uh, we'll go out for bids. I'm, I'm guessing for next year for this, right? Correct. Yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, a lot of these, these days have got uh, maintenance packages with them where they're turning around and servicing them and keeping them up to date or upgrading any ver new versions with them as well. Yeah, we've been really lucky to have them last this long. We haven't had a whole lot of problems with them. We have to replace a card from time to time. Uh, but I, we're definitely on borrowed time with some of these units. Oh, yeah. Sluice Okay, here's a rough picture of the opening that uh, we need to have sealed. Uh, I was fortunate enough to find Gruno Company, which replaced our sluice gates or repaired our sluice gates and, and new operators at the low lift years ago. So 
the projects, one of the sluice gates needs to be removed and the opening sealed. So we don't have any transfer of water across that opening uh, or the potential for, and then another sluice gate is between a common wall between our north and south uh, clear well chamber that is currently stuck in the closed position, um, which is beneficial for us because when the, we need the gate closed, we can draw down half that basin for our needed inspections and run off the other side of the basin so we wouldn't have to completely shut the plant down every time we needed an inspection. Uh, to have the gate operational is ideal so we can have it open when we're running on both sides of the basin and closed for inspection when needed. So this price would be for removing the one sluice gate and sealing the opening watertight and then repairing the other gate that is currently stuck in the closed position. And this would also make the DNR very happy. I think it would make us all happy. <laughs> oh. It would be less stressful for me if they were both, <laughs> both in this condition. Here's another one that you scared me on. It's this HVAC system. Yeah, our heating and cooling computer and operating system has been in place since 2003. I know Dan Nemi is very worried about it or <laughs> concerned or makes fun of how old our operating computer actually is in that room. So this is just kind of a starting point to see what we can get. I'm sure there's a new upgraded program that they have that won't be compatible with some of our stuff I'm anticipating. We still have some thermostats here that are controlled with the original pneumatic lines, little copper lines that run through the walls uh, that tend to leak sometimes and it's hard to track down because of course they're inside the walls. Uh, so this would hopefully get us all on on the computer operating system, all our areas of the plant here, and some of the new actuators that would, I'm sure would be needed as well. So kind of a starting point to see what we can, we can get accomplished. I, I'm, I'm concerned, Mike, that 40,000 isn't gonna be enough when you're gonna be getting into a project like this. Uh, I, yeah, I agree. and. I would expect to see something on this issue next year, but I think this would get us at least maybe some new hardware and and some ideas of what we're going to need going forward. Yeah, it's really to evaluate what we know that there's airflow problems in the new locker rooms that were not a result of the new locker rooms, but result of some of our aging equipment up there and the fans not sized correctly or or what have you. They're not putting out the right output. So all of that needs to be looked at as well, really to kind of, this is to me, I look at this as more of a study to figure out what do we need to do. And then we can come back once we figure that out. All right. And then we're back to the chlorine tank again. <laughs> yeah, we, we talked about this earlier. Our last inspection was in 2018. Um, the dive cost is a little more than some of the other things we have done just because it's an enclosed basin with limited access. They need a larger crew to check all the safety boxes and, and uh, federal and state regulations. So the cost is a little higher than some of the normal stuff we have done and having documented uh, current documentation of this tank going forward with the DNR and some of the issues we're going to deal with them, I think is a good idea to have something that's current and up to date. And it's been two years since the last inspection. Mike, how do they do that inspection of the tank? There's two access hatches and they will enter the one and they swim through the, the chlorine contact tank is baffled kind of a, like a corn maze, maybe, if you will, with, with uh, heavy duty shower curtains is how I explain it to everybody. So they'll swim that pattern halfway 
and then they will come back and enter the other hatch, the east hatch, and then swim the remaining uh, pattern, uh, going up and down, looking for cracks, leaks, infiltration, you know, the integrity of the hardware that's holding those curtains, um, and document everything with video and a written report. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other concerns on the plant? Other than maybe they ought to get a new phone system instead of the office. Yeah. It seems to work right on cue. <laughs> I think you you planted those seeds, Mike, well. Yeah, I might need to add an item for the lighting in here so my head doesn't shine so bright on these meetings. <laughs> All righty. Uh, what else we got here? Projects, Brian, I assume. Yeah, that would be me. Um, starting off with the big project, Howell Avenue Water Relay. Uh, this is the highest priority water main to be replaced uh, for the master plan. Now the master plan's not completed yet, it's still in draft form, um, but this is their, their top project. Uh, we know it's, it's been an issue for us for numerous years. Uh, we did have another break on this line Friday night, just north of this area that we're looking at. Um, and due to that, we are looking to change this so that this would include that area. So this would be a, a $1.9 million project. Um, looking to go all the way up to the driveway of the Chase Bank. And this would get rid of the, the 1956 cast iron in Howell Avenue, which will leave us with, uh, that's total of that project would then be 3,400 feet of uh, 12 inch that we'd be replacing. That would leave us with only 1,100 feet of pre-1960 water main in our system. So that would be a, a good thing to get rid of. Um, just it's, it's used its useful life of that pipe and just more and more issues that we're seeing with it. Um, All right. Brian, do you have a picture of the water main break? I was just pipe? getting to that. Awesome. And Brian, the the, the, the uh, with the incremental uh, footage you're talking about, that, but that would be done at the same time, right? It would not be a two piece. Yes, sir. Structure. Yes. Yeah, and that's um, one of the one of the determining items in there. We you know we are trying to kind of hold, not hold costs down, but kind of extend that over multiple years so we can have a little bit more uh, predictable plan going forward instead of lumping a whole bunch into one year and not doing as much the next year kind of a thing. But but having multi-year disturbance on Howell Avenue is a problem. But once Brian shows you the pictures of the water main break, that's what really threw it over the edge. Th this, the picture that you'll see is on the quote unquote good part of the main. Uh, and we all got really nervous when we saw what was there. You can see the the extensive deterioration, the depth of the section loss of that, of that material. And while the pipe on the edges looks better, we know that there's a number of these areas throughout that pipe. And as, as deep as that is, that just pushed us over the edge. So, man, we, I don't know that we have another year. We need to get on this. If we replace the section that admittedly has had more breaks, the section down south, we replace that. Uh, we could likely drive more breaks up to this location and the public's just going to have a fit if you replace some main and now you got a bunch of, in, in our emergency repair, we do a really good job, but it's so disruptive. If you could do this on a planned or scheduled event, it'd be so much better. Amen. Mike, Mike uh, can you remind me, um, I know we had contemplated this when we, we did Howell. How long ago was that? And what was um, kind of cost and our rationale, I think was like the state, I, I remember the state was attempting to bend us over and really gouge us on the price, but. Yeah, well, they, they must have taken some yoga classes because they've really bent us over now. But back then it was 2014 that we were looking at the section that was originally proposed here in your packet from Groveland to Forest Hill. And that was $447,000, I think was the estimate on that somewhere for, call it 450 or almost $500,000. Uh, and that was large, largely construction cost 
the restoration we were going to put in gravel backfill and the state when and when the state was going to come back and do their asphalt overlay over the top we were getting some credit for the asphalt overlay but but not significant now we're looking at that same project estimated at a million dollars and the reason why it's gone up so much is the state has now said we have to do full panel concrete replacement and we have to have slurry backfill underneath there the, the costs have just gone up tremendously on this and and i don't anticipate the state's going to dream up some new uh, expensive procedure for us to follow in the future. However, uh, you just don't really know. So those costs have gone up quite a bit. Yeah, it, it seems like we need to get this done. You can, you can barely tell on the top of this, this picture here, there is a crack in the middle of that, uh, yeah, right there, in the middle of that uh, corrosion path. Typically, what we see on cast iron pipe is sheer cracks like that. We believe that's what this one started as, but clearly it's going to find itself at the weak point when it, when it wants to relieve itself. So that, that's what we think happened on this one. Uh, it's not uncommon for cast iron to crack, and, and usually that repair isn't too bad. Usually the leakage isn't significant, but when you have this kind of deterioration, it just blows out the side of the pipe, and then you get a big problem. That's a pretty ugly looking pipe there, guys. It scared us all. Would we be planning to do this project next year? Yeah, I mean, so Brian was. Okay, well, let me stop, step back. So, yes, the plan was to do Groveland to Forest Hill in 2021. Brian's plan was to do, to put in for the budget, the rest of the section up to just past Susan there in 2022, I'm not sure that that was going to rise to the necessarily to the highest level of the budget needs. So I'm actually to some degree kind of happy that this break happened. It showed us how bad it is. Cause I, I really think I'm committed now. We really need to do this, this piece to get this out of our system. And, and like Brian said, it eliminates vir virtually all, quite a bit of the pre 1960 pipe. We do have some areas, uh, Shepherd Avenue by the school there. We know that's a bad area as well. That probably you'll see on next year's budget, I would guess, or 2022's budget. Any concerns, guys, about bumping this to 1.9? Well, Dale, we have to look at the, you know, the uh, overall financial picture. If you're adding another, oh, nearly a hundred million or nearly a million dollars, your unreserved funds, um, considering we're not contemplating any, uh, you know, the cash flow statement shows we're not contemplating any other funding mechanism. So we have to think about that in terms of our bond rating, make sure we got uh, adequate reserves and, and cash flows to manage that. So that's something that maybe has to be looked <laughs> covered a little more thoroughly maybe the, mike has some comments on the cash flow side of that so yes we can talk more about that when we get there absolutely okay hydrant relocation uh this is a hydrant relocation project in front of milwaukee county's road reconstruction uh from 27th to 20th uh, we are looking at relocating the the five hydrants that are out there um our schedule for this, we need to get it done before the county. Um, we're looking to have the design work completed. And then if it is possible, uh, we're gonna try and do this in-house. I am budgeting enough money in case we are not able to with manpower and staff to get this done, that we'll be able to bid this out. But our, our hope and goal is to do this uh, with Darren's crews. Okay. Centennial Drive. Centennial is slowly eroding away. Um, this is just west of the um, fire station number one. And what we've seen down there is the, the creek bed is running away from us down there. Um, since they put this in, the, the bank is now moving over and it's starting to erode out the the manholes down there uh, trying to get a couple pictures up here for you uh, this is looking from centennial one of the manholes in question is right where the cursor is there 
and let's see your cursor there. And you can see the, the bank eroding away over on this side. So the channel used to come down through here. Over the years, uh, there's a sand seam out there and this is just eroding away. Uh, there's another close up version of it. Uh, guys are getting a little nervous about being able to access manhole for maintenance. Uh, they're losing the bank back behind it and we sure don't want this thing to be tipping over or having more issues with it in the creek bank. So this is manhole number one. Go downstream to the next bend and this is the second manhole. So the, the line runs between these two and the, the creek has now come around and hit both of them. So this, this manhole is not in uh, very good shape here. So our, our initial plan is to go back and relocate this to Centennial. Uh, we'd have two drop manhole structures and then we would be going underneath the existing culvert that is on Centennial. So it's gonna be kind of a challenging project. Uh, the other option would be to go to um, a bank, stream bank restoration. Uh, initial discussions with uh, Phil is that that might be a challenge to get through DNR. Uh, definitely something that we will look at to see if we can and get that done and leave them in place and able to stabilize that bank with a long-term solution. Um, if not, it, it is gonna be challenging to do this underneath the culvert with the box structures um, to get the drop manholes in. Brian, would we have any problems with the DNR on this? Either. Any problems with the DNR? No, we don't have any problems with DNR on this. Uh, it's just maintenance issues for us and just trying to get ahead of it before we do have an issue with those structures. Okay. Uh, the, the manholes that are in, uh, that would be replaced there, and it's roughly a 26 foot deep sewer. So you know, it, it is a, a deep drop structure we'd be putting in. Low lift. Next one is uh, low lift drive. Uh, we budgeted some money on this last year. Now we put in $125,000 last year for this project. Um, we had Strand go out. They did a uh, evaluation of the low lift drive pavement. They also are working on the, the drainage issues around the building. Uh, this includes uh, additional cameras and lighting down by on the end of the low lift drive to improve security down there. Uh, one of the big issues we have it, are the drainage issues and the existing concrete flume that runs along the building, so on the north side of the building, is failing. And that flume is gonna need to be removed. Uh, they're gonna have to put in some, some membranes, uh, get in an under drain along there. And what we're looking at is a, a riprap system coming down that hill rather than a concrete flume. Um, just try and save some costs to, to get that to work. Uh, this project is uh, more than we anticipated last year. Uh, the road itself is roughly $100,000 to replace concrete sections out there. I did uh, talk with the engineering department as well at the city, uh, get their input on this and you know different solutions that they might look at as well. Uh, they did agree that the, the re concrete replacement would be better than a, a crack and seat or a, an overlay on this roadway. Uh, the majority of the road itself is in great shape. Um, drainage again, uh, along with the, the drainage is how do we get up to the, the top? We need to get up there when they have the fireworks so we can and also just so we can inspect the roof, uh, we would be able to relocate a ladder on the, the mezzanine there in order to access the roof. Uh, right now we crawl up and down the, the concrete flume and try and use that as our, our way up there. Uh, it is a little treacherous when it's wet and rainy out to get up and down that flume. So this would be a little safer way to get there. We will also replace the concrete stairs to the mezzanine that are starting to deteriorate and fall apart out there. Uh, one of the 
the big hopes with the drainage project is to install a trench drain uh, so we don't have any more staff take a tumble on the ice down there, uh, try and get the water collected so we're not icing up as bad and they can be a little safer walking in and out of down there. Yeah, we talked about this last year too. Yes. Any concerns on those guys? Sewer repairs? Uh, this is uh, just more various sanitary sewer repairs. Uh, this is kind of the rehab program. Um, we held off last year on doing a rehab program in anticipation of the master plan. Kind of give us some uh, direction and guidance for different projects. Uh, we're still working on the master plan, but they did give us a couple um, sections that we should look at for lining possibilities and just different areas to, to go after. So we're putting a project in. Uh, it's kind of a combination of um, our last year's rehab project that we did not go forward with and what the master plan is saying for this one. Uh, this would be pretty much just a lining project is anticipated. Um, just taking care of some of the, the, the sewers that are showing a lot of corrosion and, and issues with uh, infiltration. Brian, I, I noticed here in your write-up, you're talking about the utility uses the NASCO rating system to evaluate the sewer repairs. If, if I recall in the vouchers, you and somebody else went for this NASCO training uh, class. Uh, tell me about this NASCO rating system. It's kind of the industry standard. Um, it's what Andy uses when he is evaluating the sewer pipes. And it's what we have used. It's what Brown and Conwell has used in deciding where the work needs to happen. So it's a one to five rating scale. Um, it's also using uh, different evaluations for what you're seeing in the pipe as far as longitudinal cracks or fractures or infiltration or sags. So it's just a universal standard that the industry uses. Um, Seth and I did just attend uh, NASCO training. Uh, that training was for cured in place lining so, and that's, that's what this project will be focusing on as well. It'd be a lot of lining projects. So that's what that training was for. We're actually being uh, reimbursed from MMSD as part of the um, INI projects that will be reinforced or reimbursed for that training. Great. So the next page is the progress projects in progress uh, that just shows all the projects that have been previously approved and sort of where they are in their life. I'm not going to go through each one of them, but just wanted to list them for you there so you can see them. I will note Weatherly towards the bottom there. We just approved or a bit, were awarded that bid, I think at 149,000. If you want to say a total project cost on that, including design and inspection, is about two hundred thousand. We originally budgeted three seventy-five, so that's a project that's going to uh, yield back some funding back to the capital program, which is uh, which is good. Okay, if we can go back to the cash flow statement then, and talk about how this impacts our overall budget, um, it, it sort of kind of steps down through it. We take the operating income uh, that was. Uh, achieved out of the operating budget that was passed last month for both water and sewer and then total. We also look at the depreciation that is collected through rates that provides us those proceeds that we can use to fund the capital program with. From that, uh, we're going to then sort of take the status of where we are today kind of a thing. So we're gonna look at the projects that are carried over or the projects in progress. Uh, down below that is the new projects uh, and I've, Adjusted mine for the for talking purposes here. It shows uh, uh, two million nine hundred uh, or two million ninety five thousand. If we added the projects we talked about adding or increase the projects we talked about increasing, it's just over three million dollars. Uh, we we look at some of the loan payments that we have, the sort of imminent loan payments that come uh, shortly. Uh, we look at the 
where we are on our cash on hand and what accounts those are in. Uh, we then look at, again, what will be debt payments that these are the ones that are coming here in this, this December. So we want to make sure to subtract those so we don't sort of overstate our, our position. We do have a reserve item here of two point, almost $2.3 million for pollution identified at the treatment plant. That was expensed a couple of years ago now, but it's money we're holding on to earmarked for uh, dealing with that contamination when some project uh, get, does get handled down there. Uh, with that, then we have a uh, unrestricted cash. We've got a reserve balance that we maintain. That is our own reserve. That is sort of outside of the uh, restricted, which up above that you can see restricted cash. That's the bond restricted cash that we have. So we also maintain what is six months of expenses gets maintained as a reserve for those rainy day type things. Uh, and that leaves you with the end of, end of the year balance. And that end of the year balance, if you add these projects, would be three hundred and fifty-four thousand dollars on water. Stewart, sewer remains unchanged. Where I'm comfortable in presenting this to you is that we do have healthy cash reserves. That's one thing that the bond raiders were were pretty happy about. Coverage, we don't have any issues. We we should be perfectly fine there. Um, and again, a nice thing we we do have uh, healthy cash reserves. So I, I'm I'm comfortable with this, and and it will not affect. Uh, our bond rating going forward. Uh, the next time that we look to use that is going to be most likely our CT tank project of which most of the carryover funds are for that project. Does that resolve your concerns, Ken? Um, yeah, I mean, Mike's the master of the, of the finances here in, the, in Derek, so near term. So as long as they got this thing under control and they feel they're adequately reserved to maintain the bond rating, you know, I'm good to go with that from that standpoint. So, Yeah, I agree. That's a big thing, especially knowing, uh, knowing that we've got that potential big bond issue coming up for the CT tank. Uh, that, that could be a big one. So, yeah, there's something definitely on, on our focus. Uh, having gone through that with our refinancing, that was uh, helpful to draw to our attention as well again. I am probably doing a little bit of praying in the background because I'm expecting some windfalls of projects maybe in next year that there's going to be a push for like water issues uh, flowing out from the federal government to the, you know, states, et cetera such that if we've got some projects such as these, you know, on paper, that there might be potential for federal funding flowing down to the state, which could flow down to us on some of our projects, especially, you know, like water projects. So you well, never know. What we've seen so far is loans coming from the feds and, this is our pay as you go program. So we would rather not take out loans for this unless the, we have done it before if the interest was fantastic. Uh, but, but yeah, we're definitely keeping our eyes on that. We're watching with AWWA's way of, they've got a Washington district uh, that's kind of keeping her tabs on, on all of that for us. Cause I, to me, uh, uh, what, what just an absolutely wonderful shovel ready, ready project could be that CT tank project. And that man, we could really use uh, some good financing options there. So anybody got any other concerns on the uh, capital program? We should probably get a motion on that one. So I would say a, a motion to approve the capital budget as amended for those two projects, increasing the Howell Avenue water main replacement project to 1.9 million and increasing the satellite leak detection to 45,000. So what would be the total then, Mike? You got that figured for us? Sure. I do. Uh, total total water and sewer would be three million nine hundred eighty eight thousand. Mike, did you uh, did you take a gander at what your adjusted unreserved cash at the end of the year would is projected to be under that scenario? Yeah, so three hundred and fifty four thousand. Okay. Thank you. Realistically, 
the 4.2 million is unrestricted as well. Yeah, that, yeah. That's our own. We want to maintain that for the rainy day fund. In addition to that, we always maintain a $2 million balance in our checking account in order to offset the fees from the bank. That's not factored into here. So there really sort of is a bonus $2 million that's hidden in there as well. Yep. Understandable. Okay, can we get a motion on the amended budget? Secret moves to approve the capital budget for three million nine hundred and eighty eight thousand. Gill second. Roll call. Secret aye. Gill aye. Gill aye. Richards aye. Okay. Project approval. This is a project payment for Jewel Street. Uh, so this is including the change orders that we talked about earlier. Uh, we're looking at a progress payment of one hundred and eighty-eight thousand one dollars and seventy-five cents. Any concerns, guys? Uh, does this complete the payment for that project? Brian? No, it does not. We are still retaining roughly $21,000. Um, that is for the, our kind of our warranty work and make sure the contractor comes back to do the restoration that might be needed in the spring. Okay, Seepert moves to approve the amended payment for the Jewel Street lift station for $188,000. Plus. The galley seconds. Roll call. Sleeper die. Gilly. The galley guy. Richards up. Ken Aldermanic report. Thanks, guys. Yeah, just to update uh, significant stuff going on at the sea right now. We uh, continue in negotiations with the PD and uh, fire um we did uh, make an agreement with the uh, labor association of wisconsin which is essentially the dpw uh, folks and a lot of the staff in city hall uh for a 1.56 um and then a one-time non-base building i think it was 0.19 to get it to 175 so they were kind of even steven with the rest of the uh, professional staff around the city um P police have uh Negotiations there have proven to be relatively pointless to date, unfortunately. Um, and fire, we're, even though we're half a year late, we're finally going to meet with them shortly, hopefully. Uh, progress still continues to be, um, I'm not sure if progress or not, but the Schleter property on 13th Street and the uh, activity on the corner of Drexel and 13th continues. Uh, Staff continues to work with Northwestern Mutual on the property south of Ikea for a multifamily project that uh, uh, is involved with Mandel and, and the, the overall the overall uh, uh, plan on that property from animal standpoint. Uh, Sam Dickman's got another proposed building on the corner of uh, essentially right across the street from Yaskawa right on the southwest corner of uh, Oakwood in the Oakview Business Park that's in front of Planning Commission, I believe, tonight for conditions and restrictions. Um, it's a large building. Uh, and this one would actually use up the capacity that the uh, current uh, TIA is uh, envisioned. So uh, any future buildings in that park will have to uh, recontemplate traffic impacts moving forward. So that may or may not impact some potential uses that, on the remaining properties there. And then uh, Fred and company will be entertaining the uh, uh, proposal on the lakefront, which will be rolled up by uh, our uh, development partner, F Street Groups. That's Scott Lurie's firm. Matt Rink is the overall design master there. So should be uh, an interesting evening at planning and uh, looking forward to hearing the feedback on that. Anything Thanks, you guys need? Ken. What's that, Fred? Thanks, Ken. Yep. Should be fun, Fred. Yep. 
Okay, Derek, Administrative Operations. All right, so every November 15th, we do our delinquent rollover to the city and you can see the chart that's in there. I don't know if we have a real good explanation as to why, but it's gone down quite a bit this year, which during COVID, I'm not sure why that would lead to more people paying their bills, but there was a 14% decline, or I'm sorry, a 14% decline in notices and a 16% decline in actual customers that were rolled over. That must be due to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> and then our gallons build, it looks like we're doing a little better this year, which is always good. We're up almost 4% for the year. Maybe that's, maybe just more people are home with nothing to do, but the more gallons build, the better, I guess. And we're having a pretty good year too for new customers. We're up to 79 new customers on total. So the um, bonding refund issue went smoothly then? Yeah, it went very smoothly. Everything's good to go. Saving $802,000. Wow. Yep. That's great. <clears throat> yeah, we got a much better interest rate than, uh, I mean, it was from nine years ago. It's just the way the interest rates are right now, they're a lot lower. So it was a smart move as far as that's concerned. And then we did start, we started charging the 1% a month again in November. And I think we're looking at uh, January for the, for the charges that we've, we haven't been charging people for their credit card charges. And I think we're gonna start doing that again, the convenience fee in January. Any concerns, guys? Oh, looks good. I did a one question I see on the Mike on a throwaway page. Uh, what's the electric tech up to? I see they're listed here, but that was just a new customer. Did they go through a bankruptcy again or something? I know we yeah, had a there was a, something, Ken. Yeah, they had remember they had a fairly large balance outstanding and then they did. I'll have to check up on that because we sent them a letter and they were doing uh, they were on a, a bill payment plan, deferred payment agreement with us. Uh, I'll have to check up on that one. I'm not really sure what the status of that is. Yeah, they were probably our biggest offender, weren't they? If memory serves me right. Yeah, Black Bear was right there. Were they? Yeah, yeah. All right. Engineering operations. Uh, start off with the sanitary master plan. Um, Brown and Codwell has received the additional flow monitoring data from MMSD. Again, grateful that uh, MMSD is able to install these flow meters for us free of charge and collect all this data. That's a huge savings for us. Um, we found a lot of areas that were not really covered in our initial request with using the MMSD permanent monitors that were out there. So if you remember, we had a change order uh, this summer to install additional monitors. We've received that information now from MMSD and Brown Codwell is using that to calibrate the model. And it's been very helpful for them to try and narrow down some of their uh, modeling. Uh, anticipating this uh, work will be completed in December and the uh, next year we'll be getting some information from them and see where that uh, moves forward. Uh, risk and resiliency assessment. Uh, this is due to the EPA by the end of the year. I just received the final copy of this this morning, so I will review that and get that submitted here this week to the EPA. So that is on schedule. Um, once that is submitted, 
that starts our clock. We then have six months to uh, complete the emergency action plan um, that'll again need to be submitted to EPA. So we're on schedule with that project. Uh, the Howell Avenue water main project, uh, that was anticipated to get started here in November. Uh, that was delayed. Uh, Michaels is the subcontractor to Mid-City that will be doing the lining work and they got held up on a project which then pushed it into cold weather fees. And rather than pay a change order for that, uh, we pushed this off till spring. So we're waiting to see when they'll want to get started on this in the spring. And as soon as we get a schedule, we'll bring that back to you. Um, but unfortunately, it uh, won't be done until next spring. As far as uh, development projects, it's the same list of characters that have been there all summer. Uh, still trying to get these developers to wrap up their punch list items, uh, Highgate, Orchard Hills, Rawson Business Park, Hub 13, Creekside, and the condos at Oakview all still have punch list items remaining. The work itself is complete. Everything is operational, but still have a little cleanup to do on every project. Brian, with Michael's missing their start date, that's not really impacting us in any way, is it? It is not. Um, in the contracts, we gave them until June 30th of next year to complete that project anyway. Um, it's not a critical lining section to have done. Um, and it's, it's kind of a, a test section for us anyway. So it's not a concern at all to have that pushed off till spring. As a side note to that, um, Hammerhead is supplying the liner to Michaels. Um, Hammerhead is a Wisconsin, or they, they're a global company, but they do have a, a base here in Wisconsin. Uh, they did the, the spot lining repair for us uh, this summer, the demo that we did. I have reached out to them. Um, I know uh, there's some other communities and contractors that are interested in seeing this lining project happen. So we might have a, a little more hoopla with that project, uh, maybe some sort of uh, demo type installation with that project as well. Well, maybe you can turn around and charge fees for monitoring it and then we'll have another source of revenue to pay for it. Yeah, hopefully next year we can get together and actually have something happen. All right. Distribution. All right. Um, as promised at the last commission meeting, I told you uh, we'd have a break in November. So November 1st, James got a call um, out to East Putes Road, said that there was water, water main break. Uh, we've had some officers call before of a water main break that has been a false alarm. James showed up saw a little bit of water on the road and found it very odd. Um, and uh, Brian, you got that little video that I sent handy? You're muted, Brian, so. I'll start off with a little water here. So we got a little video of what James ended up finding at this location. Um, that was after it was turned down. This is right by that house, just east of Pennsylvania on the north side of the road underneath the bush. So um, the bush ended up going, that was the repair on the 24 inch. You can see the hole coming out the side over there and it had a gas line run right over the top, which those are always lovely to find when, we always ask them to move their marks when they paint the gas there and they never do. So that definitely slowed down the process, but James took a little video at about 5, 5.15 in the morning when he showed up there. Um, and it's something that we don't experience very often. So we ended up able to put a clamp on there and the clamp sealed up real good the first time. You can see a bell in the picture there. We weren't too far from a bell in the pipe, so there was like a scrub brush bush there that was kind of in the easement uh, that ended up 
being sacrificed to the main break here. All right, let's see if we can get this video to play. Roll them, Lester. <laughs> So <laughs> it's going you... above the trees. <laughs> yeah, that's what it's looking like. So James was coming from the east, so he was westbound, and he just noticed that it was like raining on his truck, and he, it was just a very weird thing. And then all of a sudden, his eyes probably got about as big as Easter eggs when he comes around the corner of the house and sees that. <laughs> so, yeah, once we, uh, once we discovered it, that was a... Uh, a pretty good amount of water. We don't get to see that very often, that's for sure. Having water going above the house and the trees. Wow. So yeah, so that was our excitement for for the to start off November. That was <laughs> that was a fun one. Um, so and then yeah, we found a couple of hydrants that we fixed. We uh, went and winterized the rest of the hydrants that we have water issues in. Um. Uh, valve repair. There's a. They're going to be replacing a meter at the treatment plant sometime. So we wanted to isolate that, the main on the north side of the treatment plant. And there's one valve in American Avenue that we couldn't get on. And if we couldn't get on that valve, we were going to have to go get on. I believe it was five valves down on 32 in American. So we figured it was worth the excavation to go down and replace the broken operating nut that we found in this butterfly valve just to help isolate the plant and to um, prevent, you know, as much water coming back as we can. So that should help them when they have to go in and replace those, that meter, I believe Mike said they're tentatively scheduled for next week, fingers crossed. Hopefully they come in type of thing. If their schedule allows. I'll believe it when they get here. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, we should be ready for them. So. So hopefully that, uh, that'll take care of that. Um, Andy had Dukes come in and treat uh, a couple lines here. He has Dukes come in and do the eight inch lines because they can foam the whole pipe. He doesn't see value in them foaming the big lines. He says it's kind of a waste of money on there, but he feels like they get a very good product to go in and foam these problematic lines that, um, can cause any kind of sewer issues and things like that. So, uh, bang for buck. We have them come in and do the eight inch lines like that. So um, he goes in and monitors and just sees what kind of results we get from there. And he's been happy with the, the results we get from that. So, and then um, just under the miscellaneous there, we spent some time with the um, engineering department down at Peter Cooper site, checking on some um, storm line issues down there. We ended up helping them find two buried structures down there. Um, which opened up a can of worms for them to try to get those opened up and figure out if they're going to keep utilizing the storm sewer they found or do some kind of repairs down there to help move water off of the property down there. As I look at your spreadsheet, mm -hmm. dear, as I look, your spreadsheet on root treatment, you got, you know, instead of usually you've got the footage and then you got the 14 3 for November. I'm assuming that's referring to the Duke's root control where they did, you know, yeah, um, lines and three manholes. Exactly, you are correct. Um, James wasn't able to get the exact footage on there. Um, because Andy was off during the time that Dukes came in. So Eric was with them. Eric wasn't sure how Andy wanted those entered into the tablet. So we couldn't get the exact numbers from Sally. So we can update that once we get the exact numbers going forward as far as footage goes. But um, off the top of my head, I, I want to say it was around 5,000 feet. Well, you know, all in all, for 11 months and 12 months almost, you know, here with this pandemic issue, you guys got an awful lot of stuff done. 
We tried. We definitely, it took a little while to get back into a rhythm and get things going. But uh, um, Andy's been graced with some good weather here in November, December. So he's plugging along, still getting footage, and um, it's definitely going to help out in the end. And hopefully we'll regroup and start over again next year. I thought we were done. Okay, plant, Michael. Well, fortunately, I don't have any of those videos from the plant like Darren has. So, <laughs> I, I, th I thought November 1st would be your high water usage, but James was able to get that throttled down in a pretty reasonable amount of time. So, I did want to point out how nice and clear the water was coming out all those holes in your pipes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a you scratch my back, I scratch yours. It's a two way right. street. <laughs> so, uh, the pumpage is pretty similar from last year down a little bit uh, up on our five-year average uh the peak day was down um for the year so uh that's obviously in the warmer months that's pretty temperature dependent uh water quality parameters are all right in what we expect and where we want them to be uh, the one thing is the average raw turbidity was very low this month, so that makes it a little easier on our plant. And the temperature swing was only three and a half degrees. Uh, and some, as we've seen in previous months, were as much as you know 15 or almost 20 degrees. So that's a little easier on Darren's system as well. Uh, preventive maintenance tasks, we completed 158 of them in two safety sessions this month. Uh, staff completed six work orders. Some of those included installing a, a, the backwash turbidity, backwash water turbidity meter, which is working. That's uh, going to be one of the things we tie into our uh, operating computer with the uh, PLC upgrade. So that'll be exciting. Uh, they rebuilt some booster station valves, uh, two different booster stations, replaced the chlorine transfer pump and installed some conduit for our PLC upgrade. So we're prepared when they finally get around to installing some of the equipment. The UCMR4 testing that you've seen on the uh, payables is now over. It started in July of 2019 and ended it at the end of October. Um, and I'm a proud member of the new WIAWWA Education Committee. We had our kickoff meeting on December 2nd. Uh, that's about all I know about that committee so far. I'll keep you updated. Mike, refresh my memory. What's UCMR4 testing? They're unreg unregulated contaminants. Uh, I, sent, I emailed you that list of mostly pesticides, cyanotoxins, and, and those types of things that aren't regulated, but they kind of want to see if they're in our water supplies uh, and get ahead of that. Yeah, that's the scary one. Yeah, when, it's all the stuff you can't pronounce that is scary. Yeah, that, you know, somewhere down the line, we might be forced into trying to uh, test for this stuff or even eliminate it. Time will tell. Okay. Mr. Sullivan, manager. I don't, I don't have anything else to add to today's meeting. All right, gentlemen. I want to wish you all a Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Same to you, Dale, and the rest of the staff. Yes, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, yep, Merry Christmas. Did the clothing come in or no? Not yet. <laughs> okay. All right. You need a signature or anything? We do. Nicole, if you're still on, you are. There you are. Can you jump in and let us know when you'll be ready for the two of them? Um, I will have every, well, everything's already out and on the table. Um, as for the this month's minutes, um, I would say give me a day maybe to get it checked over and then I'll have that ready for you. All right. I'll stop in probably tomorrow or something. 
Okay, people. Peace, Peace out. Dave. Thank you. All right. See you. Thank you. Bye. For a movement, what about adjournment? Yes, we need a motion. For adjournment at 10 48. Richard seconds. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. We're out of here. Good okay. catch. Good. Thank you. Bye bye.